In this episode of EcoEye, we'll be going to Loch Foyle to reveal the secret of the rejuvenated fish stocks. We'll find out why our native red squirrel is facing extinction. And we look at the problems and solutions to our thousands of tonnes of food waste. Until the 20th century, organic waste was almost an unknown concept in Irish life. Uneaten food from the tables of the wealthy was fed to their servants. Vegetables and meat were recycled into soups. Bread pudding and stuffing took care of stale bread. And what people couldn't eat was fed to their pigs and hens. But a century on, we live in a world of plenty that would have once seemed unimaginable. And it seems now that one third of our weekly food shop never sees the table at all. One food bag and three go straight into the bin. We seem to have gone backwards rather than forwards in our treatment of organic waste. Crudely mixing organic and non-organic garbage together in useless and environmentally tragic landfill sites. The volume of waste that goes into landfill could be reduced by at least one third through recycling household food waste. But Ireland has been slow to implement the simple segregation necessary to achieve this huge landfill economy. The problem with um, organic waste being sent to landfill is that it de degrades anaerobically, which means in an oxygen-free environment and this can cause odour issues at the landfill sites and also leachate and it creates methane gas and carbon dioxide which are greenhouse gases which cause uh, global warming. Despite their obvious benefit, brown bin schemes which collect food and garden waste from householders are the exception rather than the rule. The Dublin City Council brown bin pilot project for the Glasnevin area is one of the few such initiatives in the country. Personally, I find this great, yeah. I mean, all our, you know, vegetable waste would go into it, all our food waste would go into it, and basically anything that's going to decompose goes into the brown bin. We have three bins, green, brown, and grey bin, and we would use them kind of systematically. And like our objective is to reduce, we're actually, you know, paying per lift as well. Um, the financial side of it isn't the real issue, the, I just rather reduce the amount of waste that we use in the house. Some people feel their organic waste is too valuable to be giving away to Dublin City Council. Rathmichael National School children collect their food waste every day and use it to enhance the school garden. The food waste is placed in a wormery where the worms drag it down into the compost to digest it. When the worms have done their work, the resultant organic fertiliser is used in the school vegetable patch. As well as fertilising the garden, the main wormery is being raided to make a transparent biosphere for the classroom. Compost. The composting process becomes part of the children's biology education. And contrary to popular belief, worms make wonderful pets. Wormeries are the most efficient way of utilising food waste. 
at least on a medium scale. They're ideal for family homes, schools and other small communities. Environments that produce intensive food waste, like hotels, restaurants and fast food outlets, need more than just wormeries. These days, we eat out more, so catering raises big concerns. Around 150 tonnes of food waste per annum is now contaminating landfill. One way of dealing with this is aerobic composting. We travelled to the restaurant food waste area in the Dundrum shopping centre to see a large-scale aerobic digester in action. We have an excess of 30 restaurants in Dundrum and we have a composter which we've imported on trial from New Zealand. It's an aerobic composter to process all the food waste from all our restaurants. And with the help of our tenants we've evolved a system whereby they scrape all the contents of the plates into bags, bring it down to us down here and then we put it through the composting machine. That's a typical bag out of a restaurant that's, that's done by the staff and that's done by the staff within the restaurant. They process that completely themselves. I'll show you now the far end of what comes out. And if you look inside, then you'll see there's no heating elements, nothing. It's all absolutely natural on how it works. This is the final product that's come out of the machine. It's, it's changed its format completely. We still have what we, oh, the only additive to the machine is wood chip, which we can reuse again and again and again. There's no other element, no heating element. It's all natural, absolutely natural process. We then sieve this product. I mean, you reuse the wood chip and the compost then we, we put into it the organic waste stream. While small-scale recycling of organic waste is valuable, large-scale processing of items such as commercial food waste and farm slurry can be even more precious as a potential source of energy. The anaerobic digestion facility at Camp Hill Community mixes food, creamery and brewery waste with slurry from local farms to create methane biogas. This supplies electricity and heating energy for the 90 people living and working in the community. Other byproducts from the Camp Hill process include liquid fertilizer and compacted solids marketed as organic garden compost. But to make biogas plants like Camp Hill commercially viable, they must be able to sell their surplus electricity to the national grid. Like many other small applicants, Camp Hill have found it impossible to negotiate a power purchase agreement with the ESB. We'll never return to those simpler times when the notion of organic waste was an alien concept. Creating biogas by anaerobic digestion seems a no-brainer for the disposal of organic waste. So why are we still making it impossible for those who want to develop small-scale commercial anaerobic digestion plants? When are we really going to view the food that we fail to eat as a valuable resource rather than a nuisance? Our forests and woodlands are sanctuaries for many of our wildlife. In a world where there's increasing pressure on and loss of species of our plant and animal kingdom, these places are becoming more and more important. To catch a glimpse of a red squirrel on a woodland walk is a precious moment because reds are shy and spend most of their time in the lofty canopy of trees. Unlike its much larger American cousin, the grey squirrel, which is much more obvious and not shy at all. Reds prefer to live in conifer trees, but can be equally at home in broadleaves, like hazel woodlands or even parkland. In the photo wildlife park, they've become quite used to people and you'd have a much better chance of seeing one. They love their red squirrels in FOTA and are very concerned about the findings of a recent survey. Well, the survey has just been completed. It's been sponsored by COVID. 
Well, we found that um, the grey has, since the last survey was done in about the, the mid-1990s, the grey has spread significantly in the country. It now occupies over half the land area and has, we reckon now, replaced the red in certainly Meath. The red has become very, very rare in counties like West Meath, Kilkenny, Carlow, Louth. Uh, and this pattern may well be repeated if nothing is done in the future to help protect the red. Kerry and Cork, um, the greys are on the, the frontier there. They're coming into Limerick, they're coming into North Cork. The very ancient hazel woodlands down there, red squirrels will be replaced very, very quickly. So the people in Fota are right to be concerned, as their red squirrels may not be there for much longer. The American grey squirrel was introduced about 100 years ago. They have a broader appetite, but they also carry a virus which is deadly to the reds. One of the benefits to the red squirrels is the conifer plantations that are growing up around us, because this is the type of habitat where the reds have a natural advantage over the greys. Scots pine is one of their favourites, and if you actually look on the ground, if you're out on a walk on a Sunday, maybe you might find little pine cones that have been stripped like that. That's, that's typical evidence that you have red squirrels. The greys prefer broadleaf woodlands, where they've done tremendous damage already. They can cause widespread destruction in these young plantations and the Forest Service has put an awful lot of money into planting young broadleaves in Ireland and this stock does stand a high chance of being just written off by the grey squirrel. And the greys also threaten our few remaining native woodlands. The solution I suppose is habitat management for reds, maybe kind of protecting our coniferous plantations. Um, there will probably inevitably may need to be some control done of grey squirrels in the country. We know from what happened in England where reds are now virtually extinct, that if nothing is done to protect our red squirrels, they're doomed and have little hope to survive. No action on our part will have grave consequences for these beautiful little creatures. Another endangered species who's taken to nesting in the young forestry plantations is the hen harrier. The hen harrier is a rare bird and we've only 140 pairs left in Ireland. The male is gray with black wingtips quite distinctive to see from a distance, while the female is brown and larger than the male. They live in the uplands and have taken to hiding their nests into young forestry plantations. The food being passed on from the male to the female on the nest is sensational to watch. They use these young plantations until the canopy closes, so future forest management must ensure that there's always enough young plantations. If you were down the woods today, you might come across more than you bargained for. There are some truly exotic species out there. I'm actually in the forest today, fogging the canopy above us with this uh, machine. It um, spews out an insecticidal fog that rises through the canopy and knocks all the insects down onto my collectors. Right. Collect them, bring them back to the lab and identify what's there. The forest canopy has been described as the last great wilderness. We know less about the forest canopy than the depth of the Earth's poles. Yet we think that close to half of all the terrestrial species live up there. For the first time in Ireland, the canopy is being studied in a research project, Plant for Bio, funded by Cofort. I'm looking at the canopy insects in, in a range of Irish forest types, uh, Sitka spruce plantations, uh, plantations with canopy mixes, and also native woodlands to see if there's any differences between the, the forest types and in, in, in what lives in the canopy, um, and also to see if we can maximise biodiversity in our plantation forests. What's special about up in the canopy? Well, it's never really been studied in Ireland before. It's very anecdotal evidence we have, so just kind of word of mouth what's up there, um, and we really need to know what's in our Irish forests. They're a growing part of the landscape, so we need to find out what's up there. Um, so we can plan to manage forests better in the future, so more species can live there. In a canopy like this, in my sample area alone, which is about 24 metres squared, I'll get tens of thousands of insects from that canopy. Um, the types of insects you do get will be, there are a lot of aphids and mites, because they, the aphids will tend to feed on the sap. Um, and the leaves themselves, then the mites can be predatory or herbivorous and then you get other insects like spiders, beetles, um, flies and harvestmen which are related to spiders and are also predatory. So there's a wide range and they all feed on each other and the plants and it's very interconnected.
I have a parasitic wasp here. Um, and what they do is they lay their eggs in caterpillars um, and the eggs develop in the living caterpillar and actually eat their way out. Here's a caterpillar. Uh, they're very important as herbivores um, and they can do a lot of damage to trees. Um, but they also break down leaf matter and stuff like that. Ladybird larvae. So ladybirds are very important in um, keeping down the aphid populations. The Plan for Bio Research also investigates plant life in the canopy, birds living in the forest, and in particular, the hen harrier. They all occupy a niche in the forest ecosystem. Knowing what species live there and how they work together will help us to plan forests with biodiversity in mind. So many animals depend on our forests, colourful ones, but also less eye-catching ones. They all need a place to call home, so we need to plan our forests in a way that will help them to thrive. Most of us know it at this size, from the fish counters in the supermarket. The real thing can grow bigger than four feet. It travels thousands of miles to reach our shore and swim up our rivers. What I'm talking about is the magnificent wild Atlantic salmon. The life of a salmon starts in midwinter in the upper parts of the little rivers with pristine waters. When the eggs get spawned into nests that are called reds, the tiny fish have a sac that feeds them for the first few weeks. These ones, smaller than your little finger, are called fry. They really are small fry. After a year, their unique pattern appears, and at two years, when they're six inches long, they get their beautiful silvery color. They feed on insects in the stream, and herons and eels feed on them. They're now smolts and travel down river. Seawater is very different from fresh water and they spend some time to get accustomed to the salty water. Then they're off on a journey of thousands of miles to the cold Arctic part of the North Atlantic. They will usually return after one or two years, and the longer the salmon feed in these rich waters, the bigger they return. The water temperature in the Atlantic is rising due to climate change, and most scientists now believe that this contributes greatly to the decline of salmon stocks. Those that return have to dodge nets at sea poachers and legitimate anglers to get back to the place where they were born. The last stretch up the rivers can take months and they stop feeding. When they arrive at their birthplace, they mate and spawn. Then most of them die. This has been their story for thousands of years. This is Loch Boyle, bordered on one side by Donegal and on the other by Northern Ireland. Each year, more than 30,000 wild salmon go through here, heading for the 18 rivers that flow into the estuary. The people in charge of protecting these salmon are the Locks Agency. I joined Art Nevin to see how this cross-border agency monitors the wild salmon numbers in the Foyle River Basin District a vast area that includes a quarter of Donegal and one third of Northern Ireland. We monitor the fish stocks in a number of ways, uh, including fishermen's catch returns, electronic fish counters built across the river, uh, electrofishing surveys such as this. This technique temporarily stuns the fish so that they can be counted and measured. After we've electrofished them, we'll identify them to species, so we'll tell whether they're salmon or trout. So this is a salmon nut plus, so it's salmon. Uh, fryer or young of the year. It allows us to get a snapshot throughout the large foil area. Uh, so we fish approximately four or five hundred sites every year. So what about water pollution? Well, the fish are a very good environmental indicator of the water quality, but we also monitor the water quality of the rivers in the foil area. The Lux Agency use two methods really for testing water quality. Firstly, the biological assessment where we use a kick net here, and we use that in the river to collect the little bugs um, the bugs are very important too because they are the food for the fish. Uh, we also um, lift a uh, water sample in a bottle uh, for the chemistry if you like and we take that back to the lab for analysis. So the different types of bugs or invertebrates tell you the, the quality of the water? There's a different array of bugs um, and each one can tell us a story about the water quality, uh, whether it's good or bad. It's hard to believe that the salmon come up these tiny tributaries to lay their eggs. So Art, on a small stretch of river like this, what stage in the salmon's life occurs here? 
Well, everything, I guess, from spawning uh, to all the juvenile stages, and then the returning adult will stay here as well. Predominantly, it would be spawning and nursery area. So, the success of the next generation depends on the state of these little rivers. And what now do you do to reinstate a river like this? The first sort of uh, thing that's really important to do is to create fenced areas so the cattle can't walk through the river. So we've introduced these, these spawning size gravels, okay? And it can create both nursery and spawning habitat. As the eggs hatch out, they'll come down and there's more stone here that we've introduced. You know, a little bit bigger than the spawning gravels. And as the newly hatched out uh, Alvin and Fry come down here, they develop feeding territories here. So a deep still pool like this, Art, is this important? It's very important that uh, this deep water is here for the adult fish, because obviously they couldn't survive in the shallower water. So really all stages in the life of the salmon are here. Oh yeah, this river has uh, got spawning areas for the, for, the, for the eggs. It's got the nursery area for the juvenile sort of fry and par, the small fish, you know. And then it's also got the deeper holding areas for the adult fish whenever they're returning. How much recreational fishermen are allowed to fish depends on the number of returning salmon. Catch and release is the preferred option, but all fish caught must be tagged and in 2007 a maximum of 25 tags were issued per fisherman. The fresh waters of the Foyle River entered the sea at Loch Foyle, which is a large marine estuary. Hello. I joined one of the patrol boats leaving from Derry. Yes indeed, my name is Barry Fox from the Loch Agency. Hi Barry. The main purpose of our patrolling is to protect the, the salmon migrating up the foil system. Um, we have a number of areas along the system and in the river catchments where fish would be targeted by poachers and our job really is to make sure that they get as little fish out of the system as possible. The guys that operate in, uh, in the foil system would be very, very sophisticated. Um, basically they would monitor our radio frequencies, they would follow our cars, they would keep an eye on the agency offices to see what kind of activities we were doing. And they have, a, they have their own band on, on a shortwave radios that they can, t they can let people know where we are and what we're doing. It is quite possible for, for a, an organised team to take anything between 100 200 fish in a night, which is quite a lucrative operation for them. Loch Foyle is a large estuary, bordered by Donegal on one side and Derry on the other. But who does it actually belong to? Well, that's an interesting question, Duncan. Um, there is no boundary uh, as such in Loch Foyle. No boundary? No. Um, from the agency's perspective, back in 1952, the, the two governments actually developed two identical pieces of legislation to allow the what was known then as the Foyle Fisheries Commission to actually manage the loch and the catchment area both north and south. The estuary is very shallow, about five metres deep. This allows water temperature to reach a balmy 20 degrees Celsius, which is unusually warm for Irish waters. One native species that loves this water temperature, besides ourselves, is the native flat oyster. We know that oysters have been fished in the loch for at least 500 years. Loch Foyle we recognise as one of the best oyster fisheries in Europe and without a doubt it, it produces the most wild oysters in Ireland. We have a large mussel fishery here as well. The oyster fishery will be traditional fishery. Um, still fishermen make a very good living from it as where the mussel farming as such would be a business. Big business. Very big business. Loch Foyle oysters are famous and are highly prized in the five star restaurants in Spain and France. But they're also enjoyed locally. Now I'm going to see if these Loch Foyle oysters are as good as they say. Oh, they are. Here's Stuart. Most of the food we eat today has come from somewhere else, sometimes halfway around the world. A traditional Sunday lunch made up of imported goods can have travelled 79,000 kilometres and have released 37.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide. A low carbon diet means eating food that is grown locally, such as fruit and vegetables in season, and if possible, unprocessed and organic foods, and you can reduce your carbon emissions by up to 75%. In our next episode of EcoEye, we look at the research into the changing biodiversity in the burn. We explore the spectacular ancient geoparks of Waterford's Copper Coast. And we investigate Ireland and Galway's drinking water issues.